should Messianic Jews live like traditional Jews in order to win traditional Jews? And how should Jewish believers in Jesus relate to Jewish tradition? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on The Line of Fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on what will be a very unique broadcast on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Number to call 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. A little background, and then I'm going to bring on my guest, David Costello. A few years back, there was a report, different parts of the Jewish world saw the news flashes. For example, Jerusalem Post reporting that there was a Christian couple posing as Orthodox Jews, trying to win Orthodox Jews to Jesus in Chicago. So it was a headline on the uh, Jewish, uh, Jerusalem Post. And then I saw a Jewish telegraph agency, so widespread Jewish news, reporting the same thing. This was scandalous. This was shocking. A couple that unashamedly said, we believe Jesus is the Messiah, living as traditional Jews and saying, we're, we live as traditional Jews because that's what Jesus wants us to do. And then it, it was even reported in the New York Post uh, headlines as well. New York Post saying the very same thing. So this was big news. I was even contacted by different people in the Jewish world asking me about this because I'm in constant contact with ultra-Orthodox rabbis. Most recent contact earlier today, I mean, it's, it's day and night, constant interaction for decades, interacting with that community and loving that community very, very deeply in the midst of our deep differences over Yeshua. So this report was very scandalous, and it furthered uh, the it, it gave further fuel to the fire that Jewish believers in Jesus are deceptive and will will go to any means to try to trick religious Jews, etc. Well, in any case, that's that's what I'd read about it. There was another case somewhere else similar. Well, a few months back, we were contacted by the gentleman involved in this, David Costello, his wife Rivka, uh, living in Chicago. They said they have a Messianic synagogue, Ahavas uh, Chinam, uh, which is Hebrew for baseless love. So love without any cause or reason, what Yeshua shows us, as opposed to the baseless hatred that put him to death. And they said they'd like to come on my radio show and present what they do and why. And on their own Facebook page, they advertised it as wanting to come on and debate me and win people over to their position. So we are prepared to differ. Just so you know, coming in, we are prepared to differ. It's not that I'm setting my guest up or that he's going to surprise me. We are prepared to differ. But first, we'll get some basic background. So I just want to give you the, the, the large picture and without further ado, let me bring on uh, David and Rivka Costello. Thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on. You are very welcome. So, David, is it uh, just you or you and Rivka? Uh, it's just me. Rivka has to take care of our now four kids. We just had a baby about a month ago. Oh, so all a right. Lot of nursing involved and stuff like that. So. C congratulations. All right. So, thank you. First, let's let's just lay out a couple of things for information's sake. I've read different okay. reports about whether you and Rivka are Jewish according to Jewish tradition, which would mean that your mother is Jewish. We'll put aside the question of are you a convert to another religion and that debate, but just to be clear on this so we can set the record straight, uh, are you Jewish according to Jewish tradition? Um, so um, the basic answer of that is sort of, uh, it's up in the air. There's a good question about it. I asked Chabad to look into it. Um, they circumcised me, uh, called me up for an aliyah, and I was expecting to go into uh, the mikvah to get a uh, what's a what's considered a conversion, uh, just to just to be safe. Um, there are family members who say that we are Jewish, um, and uh, on my side, uh, and so Rivka has gone through a um, has gone through a messianic conversion uh, with a rabbi who has Orthodox mika, um, but she has got she she and the kids have gone through an Orthodox conversion. So she was not uh, not Jewish uh, originally, but after the conversion uh, through the messianic thing, it's uh, we consider her Jewish in that sense. But the Orthodox world may not think so. 
Okay, yeah, the Orthodox world certainly wouldn't think so, but just just wanted right. to be clear on that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just that first. Secondly, uh, what do you believe about Yeshua? In, in terms of, so, quote, salvation, forgiveness, coming into right relationship with God, we, we can talk about the tradition. That's what we'll focus on the rest of the broadcast, all right? But first, just yeah. the most basic things. For a listening audience with plenty of Christians, plenty of Messianic Jews, plenty of Jews who don't believe what we believe. So give, give your sure. basic views there. Um, so my basic view is that Yeshua is Messiah, and um, that he has come to get us to um, get into a uh, better relationship with God, a full relationship with God, um, that we would walk with him in obedience uh, to uh, what God has um, put out and uh, what he has declared, decreed for our lives, and so that we can be in right relationship with him, um, and we can have True fellowship, uh, true fellowship, and complete fellowship with Him. Um, we believe also that it's halakhically required to believe a Messiah, as, as the Rambam says uh, in his Mishnah Torah, that you you have to believe in Him in Messiah, um, and that you have to um, walk according to all of the halakha. If you're Jewish, if you're not Jewish, um, you don't need to keep um, any halakha, just the seven Noahide laws. All right. Do you believe that He's eternal deity? Uh, no. No. Okay. Got it. All clear on that. So you don't believe in God's triunity in any way? Right. Okay. So how did Jesus come to be? Um, so Jesus, uh, his soul was formed um, before, the found, before the foundation of the world. Uh, it's taught that in, in uh, Midrash. Um, the Messiah's soul and his name was uh, pre-thought before the, before the creation of the world. Um, it's one of the few things that were created before the foundational world, and of course, uh, Messiah was first. Um, and so he was born um, from Mary and Joseph, and um, he uh, he lived his life and then died and resurrected. Okay, so so just so we're clear on this, then that your your belief would be in terms of his preexistence closer to a Jehovah's Witness than a traditional Christian. In other words, because you don't believe he's eternal deity, you believe he was created at some point but was pre-existent. I don't mean an exact right. parallel. Okay, right. So that, in my view, would be heretical. I mean his soul, right? Right. So not that, his physical body, <laughs> right? But he's he's a created being, and you don't you don't worship him in any way as God, right? Okay, right. So yeah, right there, from my perspective, that's heretical. Just just so we can be clear, and again, right. my my reason for laying this out, David, is not to attack but to have fair understanding of, of that of which we speak. Clear enough? Right. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, is it widely known when, when other Christians talk about your work or, quote, missionary work or reaching unreached, that you hold these views? Is that widely known in your circles? Um, yeah. I mean, I've done a couple of other interviews uh, recently. Um, there are people who, uh, who know it. Uh, my parents know it. Um, a lot of people that we talk about know it. Um, you know, if you're going into a pastor to talk at a church or something like that, these are questions that are asked. Um, and so um, we answer them. Right. Uh, and to the best of our ability. Okay. So I, I, I want to absolutely say that in a little while, I, I want to give you a few minutes to just lay out your argument and make your case, and then I'll respond. Okay. So, so sure. right now I'm, I'm, asking questions to gather information because I don't know you at all beyond the couple of emails and the little bit that's available online. So if right. you're answering away, like I didn't know that you believe that until this moment. So I wasn't trying to set you up, but just trying right. to probe. Okay. In, yeah. in your view, if a Jewish person who spent time with you, heard the message, seen your arguments, openly and willingly rejects Yeshua. So it's not someone that's being persecuted by the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages and being told, be baptized or die, and they have no clue right. who Jesus is. But they spend time with you, your community, they've heard the message, they've seen your lives, and they reject him. Or are they in any sense lost? Does it affect their eternal destiny? Um, so I'm not so much concerned about eternal destiny. I care more, mostly about your relationship with God, and I believe your relationship with God is correct. Um, then your eternal destiny will also be correct. And so 
Um, my main concern is whether or not they are connected um, to God in a correct way. And so, uh, again, the Rambam also brings this up in his Mishnah Torah as well, um, so that if you reject him, Messiah, um, then you are um, essentially one who has thrown away the Torah and the mitzvot, and so therefore you are not big courses. So that would affect um, your standing from a Jewish perspective as to whether or not um, you have a place in the world to come. Right, but but you but you know every time you quote Rambam, you just did him a massive disservice because Rambam categorically rejected Jesus along with Muhammad, and the Messiah of which he spoke was not the crucified Messiah. He was patently clear on that that if he's the Messiah, he will not die before completing his mission. So the Messiah of which he spoke is a different one than Jesus. So when you when you refer to the Rambam to now make reference to belief in Jesus, you've it's just like if I say, well, the president said, but I'm not talking about President Biden. I'm talking about President George Washington. It's right. putting it's putting words in. I mean, surely you know this. You've read enough to know this. Absolutely. And any and I'm thinking of traditional Jews listening to this who say, well, what's he doing? He's just misrepresenting Maimonides here. So the Rambam says that Yeshua tried to be Messiah, um, but he uh, failed with it. He prepared the world for Messiah so that... Um, when it came time for Messiah to come, in Judaism there's two Messiahs. There's Messiah ben Yosef and Messiah ben David. So in his mission, where he's talking about um, the Messiah ben David, the one who is going to bring the kingdom. And so uh, with Messiah ben Yosef, he prepares the world for preparation for the final redemption, which is um, what we believe that Yeshua is uh, doing currently. But, but, um, David, but David, David, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know that's not yeah. what he meant you know he was not making Jesus into Mashiach ben Yosef. In fact, in those very passages, he doesn't mention Mashiach ben Yosef in, in any uh, redemptive way. There, in, in, point, in point of fact, and, and you can respond on the other side of the break. I, I didn't expect to fall into this ditch immediately, but integrity requires me to point this out, that, that according to Maimonides, that when the real Messiah comes, Christians and others, Muslims, they will repent of the lies that they believed. So believing in Jesus or believing in Muhammad. So please, whatever you do, make your case without Maimonides, because he's against you. You can respond on the other side of the break. We will be right back. <clears throat> There's nothing more central for the follower of Jesus than the resurrection. There's nothing more important than that fundamental question, did he rise from the dead or not? In fact, it's so strong. First Corinthians 15, Paul was dealing with questions about the resurrection of the dead in general. And he says this, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So if there's no future resurrection, the dead aren't raised, then he wasn't raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So if he didn't rise, throw the whole thing out. Throw the Bible out, throw our faith out, throw it all out. So the big question is, can I prove that he rose? Yes and no. Yes, in my own life, 100%. In the lives of hundreds of millions of Christians, 100%. In other words, we have experienced the reality of his resurrection. I know that I know that I know that he rose from the dead. He has changed my life. He has revealed himself through the cross. He has set me free from the sins that bound me. I commune with him. I know him. I love him. He is risen. Yes, he lives within my heart because he has risen from the dead. And if you'll truly cry out to God and earnestly seek him for the truth, he will make that truth known to you and he will reveal his son to you as well. However, I cannot demonstrate in an absolute way that he rose from the dead to the satisfaction of a skeptic or a mocker or 
even someone with serious questions. I can give very strong, plausible evidence that he rose from the dead. I can explain that the resurrection from the dead is the best way to understand what happened and the only logical way to understand what happened in history. I can give you very, very strong, plausible evidence, but to know for your sure, for absolute certainty for yourself, you must encounter God through the Word and the Spirit. Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the line of fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back, friends, to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Michael Brown, delighted to have you with us. Please check out our Real Messiah website, realmessiah.com. You can watch debates I've had with rabbis. You can read or view answers to the most common Jewish objections to Yeshua. Get lots more information, refutation of some of the counter-missionary videos of Rabbi Tovia Singer. Tons of great resources for you, all free at realmessiah.com. All right, I'm, I'm speaking with David Costello, who asked if he could come on the radio show and debate with me about Hasidic Jews and Jewish tradition. We've already discovered some profound differences in belief as to who Jesus is, views that, uh, in my view, and, and most of the church would be, cons and most of the Messianic Jewish community would be considered heretical, which, David, is obviously no news to you. So right before the break, I said that yeah. you are using Maimonides, Rambam, in a duplicitous way. I feel a million percent sure that any traditional rabbi would agree with me in a heartbeat and that they would say you are deeply misrepresenting him and that when he says that in one way Jesus prepared the world uh, for the coming of the Messiah, that's by getting the talk, knowledge about Messiah out, that there is such a one as the Messiah. And, and Muhammad did uh, by, even though they both brought terrible destruction to the world, that Muhammad did good in that Islam has put an emphasis on keeping the commandments. So when the real Messiah comes, he doesn't talk about Mashiach ben Yosef there, but when the real Messiah comes, Mashiach ben David, uh, the one of whom he speaks, uh, that right. that's now the way has been prepared so that as Jeremiah prophesied, these people who've been influenced by the Christians and Muslims, they will repent of the lies they believed and turn to the one true God. So again, when you speak of Maimonides and his confession, which is not about Mashiach ben Yosef, it's about Mashiach ben David, to say daily, right. I believe in the coming of the Messiah. And you say, well, that means we have to believe in Jesus. No, Maimonides rejected Jesus. He was talking about the traditional Jewish Messiah. You must know that right. to me, again, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a little surprised, to be honest. So if I'm reacting in a surprise way, it's not put on. I, I'm surprised that you would do this because it seems to be blatantly deceptive and something that any traditional Jew would recognize in a moment. Well, I have discussions with um, Orthodox Jews all the time about it, and obviously they disagree with me. But um, but there is place to uh, point out a disagreement into who is Messiah. Um, a, a more a maybe a possibly better place is um, I mean, actually David Valley says that uh, Yeshua is the uh, the sowed of Mashiach ben Yosef, and so um, there is um, that as well. Um, he says a lot of other negative things, but I just think that Yeshua himself uh, was proponent of keeping the oral law, and a, and a lot of that has to do with sort of um, what we were going to talk about, the idea of um, Yeshua keeping the oral law. A lot of those lies and things that I think that is talked about in uh, the Mishnah Torah is the idea that the oral law and the law itself has been done away with. And I, so I think that one of those things, and, and I think Yeshua himself really um, goes after uh, or at least uh, argues for the oral law in a number of places. In fact, I have 26 places in Scripture where either Yeshua or his disciples um, actually uphold oral law. And so I think that's what it's, uh, what it's discussing. Um, All right, but would you, would you agree? It, what, so so you'll, you'll have ample time to present some arguments to back your case, yeah. but would you agree, just very simply, with, in, with integrity before God, mm -hmm. Would you agree that when Rambam, Maimonides, says it is the tenet of the faith that we confess our belief in the coming of the Messiah, he was not talking about Jesus. He was talking about a traditional Jewish Messiah, not someone 
who died, who was crucified and rose from the dead. He was not talking about Jesus. He was talking about traditional Jewish messianic expectations. Would you agree with that? Yes, as, the, as, as, as I, was describe, I would describe that as Mashiach and David, yes. Okay, fine. So when you made reference to we have to believe in him because Maimonides told us to, he didn't say believe in Jesus. He didn't mean believe in Jesus. He presupposed he rejection of Jesus. Messiah, son of David, not someone who would be crucified in his view. Yes. Okay. All right. I, I hope you drop that argument then because it's, it's deceptive right out of the, the gate. And then last question, and then you can go ahead and, and begin to make your case for uh, why Jewish believers should keep the, the oral law. So to get back to the question about a religious Jew today, God's the judge of every human being, right? But right. the fact that you went with your wife to missionize and to bring your particular brand of faith to traditional Jewish community means that you think these people would be enhanced or helped by knowing about Jesus. So can a traditional Jew, without any reference to Yeshua, without any reference to what he did on the cross, without any reference to his atoning blood, simply by seeking to honor God and follow the written and oral law, as, as hundreds of thousands or several million Jews around the world today, could that person be in right relationship with God, theoretically, in your view, an intimate fellowship with God, right relationship with God, completely aside from Yeshua? No. Got it. So then if they're not in right relationship with God now, that could affect their eternal destiny. Yeah, but again, I'm not, I'm not uh, super concerned with that as much. But yes, and that, that is the idea. Okay, got it. All clear. All right, so we've got a few minutes before the break. So okay. go ahead and begin to make your presentation. It's, it's radio time. It's not a formal face-to-face -face lengthy debate. So we've got right. breaks. But start in on your argument as to why Jewish believers in Jesus, and again, we're, we differ on who he is, but Jewish believers in Jesus are required to keep the written Torah and the oral Torah. Yeah, I mean, he, he teaches the oral Torah and he makes use of the oral Torah, and so does Paul and um, other uh, disciples as well. Um, I'll just list off the verses where I see him actually using oral law in order to defend, uh, in order to teach what he, what he teaches. Um, I'll start with sort of the first one. He says that the most important law is the belief in the unity of God. So he says that the Shema is foundationally, is foundation to all other uh, keeping of the Torah and mythos, which is what traditional Judaism believes as well. So uh, that goes back to that first question that you had asked me. Um, the idea that the Shema, that God is one and only one, um, is foundational to that, and that is, in fact, a teaching that is followed by the Pharisees. Um, he li I'll just list the verses off and then just uh, bring out a couple of things. In Matthew 12, 11, Matthew 12, 1, Mark 2, 23, Matthew 12, 5, Mark 2, 27, Luke 4, 16, Luke 13, 15, Luke 23, 54 to 56, John 7, 23, Acts 1, 12, Acts 3, 1, Acts 16, 1, Romans 3, 2, uh, Hebrews 8, 5, um, Luke 14, 1, Matthew 13, 24 to 43, Luke chapter 1, um, with the naming of John, um, and then we have in Matthew 23, 35, and Matthew 23, 1, he says that those who sit upon the seat of Moses um, have the authority to do as they do. Um, Revelation 12, 7, uh, Acts 21, 28, Acts 8, 30 to 34, Luke 24, 20, uh, 24, 27, 1 Corinthians 11, 17, Acts 14, verse 15, uh, Matthew 5, 17 to 38, Matthew 18, 18. So these are the verses where um, there's a lot more, but uh, those are sort of the verses that I um, had prepared for instances where Yeshua is either um, keeping oral law or engaging in oral law and teaching others to do so as well. So um, I and, think that that really is a foundation for that. Got it. So, of course, I, I categorically reject your position for, for many, many reasons, based on Scripture, first and foremost. But uh, we'll go back and look at some of those examples. Uh, for those yeah. that are not familiar with some of the citations, many I recognize in my head and have responses to immediately others. I'll have to check the reference. But I, I could list a million verses. The question is, are, 
do they say what, but I think they say, is, is the argument sound? Otherwise, it's zero plus zero plus zero equals zero, or substance plus substance plus substance makes a very powerful argument. All right, listen, we've got a break coming up. So a quick question, okay. and then, yep. then we'll dive in deeper. Uh, I want to ask you questions where Yeshua renounces various traditions of the Pharisees, et cetera. And then, then you pick your best verse or two, and you'll open that up. But I just want to understand, because one of the great issues with oral Torah is that it's conti it continues to be lived out in the rabbinic community today. So who is the orthodox or ultra-orthodox rabbi whom you follow and to whom you are submitted? Um, right now we've been placed under harem, we've been kicked out, so I don't really have an orthodox rabbi I can follow, um, unfortunately. So Yeshua is, the, is my Rebbe uh, in the way that I see it and the rabbi that I follow. Yeah, the reason I asked was one of my ultra-Orthodox friends said uh, if he met someone like you, that would be the very first question he would ask right. you. And of course, because he would instantly view you as a heretic and reject you, uh, which obviously happened the moment people found out how you really were, however sincere your intent, the moment they found out how you really were, they, they put you under the ban. You were, you were excommunicated, uh, and traditional Jews would not look at you or your wife as Jews at all, so they just look at you as... Christian imposters. Now, Christians would say, you're not Christian either. You're denying fundamentals of the faith here. So obviously you're sincere, but but with a very small group uh, in, in agreement here, it doesn't make you right or wrong. But to make clear again, you are not living as a follower of Jesus in my book. You're not living as a traditional Jew in the book of traditional Judaism, as you know. And that's the situation in which you find yourself. All right, and remember, friends, David asked to come on the show. Please remember that. We'll be right back. Is it true that all sins are equal? That sin separates you from God, period? That James, Jacob teaches that if you break one commandment, you, you break them all, you're, you're now a lawbreaker. If, if you commit adultery, well, you've broken the law, therefore you're a lawbreaker and, and all sins are equal. Is that true? Well, no, it's not true that all sins were equal. And, and nowhere does the Bible teach that all sins are equal. All sin is deadly. All sin is wrong. All sin has negative effects. But no, 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 no. Of course not. All sin is not equal. Now, now, the Bible tells us that explicitly. For example, in John, the 19th chapter, as Jesus is dealing with, with Pontius Pilate, he, he says this in John chapter 19. He, he says that the, 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 the people that delivered me over you, they, they've committed the greater sin. He said, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. There is such a thing as greater sin. In Matthew 23, Jesus speaks to religious leaders and said, okay, you tithed scrupulously. You gave every land. Okay, you did that. Great. He said, but you neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Uh, one of my colleagues likes to explain it like this. A man comes home from work one day and his wife says, hey, didn't you have that big business luncheon? How was it? And he says, well, it was good, but I'm, I'm a little embarrassed. I was a real glutton today. I mean, I, I kept eating those rolls. Those dinner rolls were so good. Then I had this extra dessert. I, I like pigged out today. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed. He goes, oh, honey, come on. It's a special business luncheon. It's no big deal. He goes, oh, okay. Next day he comes home from work. Hey, how was work today? Well, good. I mean, I, 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 I had sex with three different ladies during the, uh, during the day. I just kind of went off with these different ladies and had sex. But, oh, is she going to react the same way to that, that she reacted to the overeating the day before? Obviously not. And when you go back through history and look at how God judges Israel, he doesn't judge them because yeah, I had a wrong thought. No, he judges them because they were murdering each other. 
because they were sacrificing babies to idols. He, he judges them because of the evil they committed on a serious level and on a repeated level over a period of time. Which, which is worse, if I think a wrong thought about someone or if I carry out that thought and then I carry it out repeatedly? Obviously, all sins are not equal. Jesus died for all of our sins because sin, period, separates us from God. But no, all sins are not equal. Common sense tells you that. The Bible tells you that as well, even speaking of some sins that are unto death in a unique way. Dr. Michael Brown, get on the line of fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Oh, what beautiful words, straight from Scripture. Michael Brown, welcome back to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. By the way, if you're unable to get through today, if we don't get to calls later in the show, about 45 minutes from now on our YouTube channel, ASKDR Brown, Ask Dr. Brown on YouTube, we'll be doing our weekly live Q&A chat. So it's a great time for you to weigh in there or ask your questions there. So that'll be 4.15 Eastern time, Ask Dr. Brown, ASKDR Brown YouTube channel, where some of you are watching live right now. All right, I want to get back to uh, my guest, David Costello. So, David, a- another very specific question. And, and hang on, let-, let me do this. For our listeners not familiar with the concept of oral law, traditional Jews believe that God gave Moses the written law, Torah Shebichtav, and the oral law, Torah Shebaalpeh, and that that contains interpretation, understanding, application of the oral law some given by revelation to Moses, some developed in each generation as, been, as, as the laws have been passed down and lived out. And Halakha speaks specifically of traditional Jewish law. In the New Testament, it's reflected uh, with the Pharisees often and what's referred to as the tradition of the elders, which in Judaism becomes known as the tradition of the fathers, and then put in writing a couple of centuries after the time of Yeshua in the Mishnah and then subsequently developed in the Talmud, law codes, etc., which are studied and still developed with commentary to this day. So, David, it's it's your view that the rabbinic leaders, none of whom followed Yeshua, in other, in other words, the, the ones that were quoted in the Mishnah, going back to Hillel and Shammai and after, none of them, to everything that we have recorded, believed in Yeshua. So the contemporaries of the, the Pharisees and then the rabbis that followed them None of them believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Right through the, the Talmudic rabbis, so the Tanaim, the Zugot, leading up to the last, last uh, pair that would have been in Jesus' day, but then the Tanaim, and then after that the Amorayim, then after that the Savarayim, and, and then the, the Rishonim, the Achronim. So the entire st- uh, stretch of tradition from then until now, with all the, the leaders of it, all of them did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. And many, of course, had no real idea who he was as the centuries developed and he became lost in a lot of church tradition. But in your view, they accurately transmitted the traditions and God was with them in doing so to the point that we need to follow all, all of that stuff right up until today, but they were wrong about the Messiah. Is, is that correct? Does, does that trouble you at all or make you wonder how they could be um, so off and yet so on? No, it's, uh, it's not troubling to me. Um, they have been given the, as Romans 3, 2 states, they've been given the oracles of God. And so um, the Jewish people are, it's their duty to pass it down. Yeshua himself interacts and goes to eat with the Pharisees. Um, he was largely anti-Sadducees, uh, which would today be sort of a sola scriptura understanding of things. Um, and we do see him siding more with the Pharisees. Um, and in fact, in the, the book of John, um, he uh, John says that there is one among you who do not know. It says, speaking of, uh, of Messiah, and there uh, he's talking to people who sent from the Pharisees. And so um, he was working within the system 
Um, I recently had an Orthodox uh, rabbi I was talking to say, "Oh, I never realized. Yeah, he's working within the within the Jewish system. He's not uh, he's not outside of the Jewish system. He's actually inside of the Jewish system." Right, and but so he, sa- the, he says to that Jewish system is very specifically Mark seven, Matthew fifteen, very specifically with reference to these very traditions, the traditions of the Pharisees. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. And in numerous points, you know, Matthew has constant conflict between Yeshua and the Pharisees. He's rejecting their traditions. Yeah, he lived among them, so there's certain things he would do and certain he didn't do. Go to the synagogue, but then rejected other traditions and pronounced seven woes on them in Matthew 23 based on their traditions. So he's within the system as a first century Jew, Right. Some have found harmony with him, with Sadducees, some harmony with Essenes, some harmony with Pharisees. I mean, Jesus scholars debate that to this day. But he has some very, very strong things to say about how their traditions nullified the Word of God. Um, So there's, first off, there are a few, in Mark chapter 7, where he's talking about the hand washing, there are actually two groups of Pharisees. There is one group of Pharisees called... um, Beit Shammai, there is another group of Pharisees called Beit Halal. You could think of them as two denominations of Pharisees. Um, at the time that Yeshua was on the earth, there was a debate about the hand washing. Beit Shammai held that you should hand wash for every bit of food, whereas Beit Halal uh, held that you should only wash hands uh, for the temple. And so he's obviously, in this case, debating Beit Shammai. Um, he's arguing against him, but it is something that had not yet been. Uh, it's not an old tradition. It's a new tradition that was trying to come out at the time of Yeshua. Um, it was not fully established at that point in time. Um, later, when the temple was destroyed, in fact, we now wash our hands to remind us that the temple was destroyed. And so um, one of the reasons that we wash our hands is to remind us that the temple was destroyed. At the time Yeshua was speaking these words, the temple was standing. And so he would have an issue with eating non-holy food, food called pulin, uh, with washing of the hands, whereas the um, whereas the, the whereas Beit Shammai uh, would wash hands for anything that they ate at, at that time. It's one of the reasons that we dip our uh, carpets in salt water is because uh, to remember uh, in, in the times and to honor uh, sort of the traditions going back uh, that they would actually uh, wash for every type of food that they would eat. You, re- um, you realize that ignores the whole reasoning that Jesus gave in the passages. No, he's talking about that it is um, not what you're supposed to do. Oh, no, no, no. Um, well, no, no. You know the passage. He yeah. says that what you eat doesn't defile you. What comes out of your heart defiles you. So the conclusion, this is these are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. It has nothing to do with temple standing or not. You're trying to read these later debates into it in, in a way that now ignores the point he was making, which was what Paul reiterates, that food in itself, nothing in itself is unclean. So meaning that if, if you were blindfolded and were being fed and you, you thought it was beef, but it was actually pork, it, it doesn't actually defile you. That, that It doesn't spiritually defile. So therefore... That violates with your, Torah in, in Deuteronomy chapter... Uh, I believe it's Deuteronomy chapter 11 or Leviticus 14, it's, I believe. Uh, I'm getting those. Yeah, you got them uh, reversed. Le- right it's, Levit- it's Leviticus right, yeah. 11 and Deuteronomy, Leviticus 14. 11, Deuteronomy 14. No, it yeah. doesn't violate that at all. They were to be unclean to Israel. They are unclean for you. That's what the text says. That's why. And he's talking to Jewish people that said that it's unclean. And Paul said that nothing in itself, he's referring with the inside of Yeshua, that nothing in itself is actually unclean. God can say this is unclean for you. Okay, therefore you don't eat it, right? No one. No one's arguing that point, right? But the point here is the reason that that eating with unwashed hands doesn't defile is because this is an exterior thing. Whether your hands are washed or not has nothing to do with the spiritual condition of food because food doesn't have a spiritual condition. In, in any case, the Jesus, reason— Food has spiritual condition. Fine. Jesus says the opposite, all right? Here, let's, let's just read what he says here Be- because— What's increasingly clear is, and I say this with all respect and love, you're on a path that in not too long will just have you, well, you're already there. Jesus is another 
rabbi, but the most important one. You've, you've denied other fundamentals. The rest will be denied not long after. And then perhaps you'll succeed in converting to Orthodox Judaism and fully apostatize. I, I, I watched this for decades. And it's, it's not, it's a sad thing. It's a tragic thing, but I've watched it for decades. And the pattern is always the same. So ultimately, rabbinic tradition is the lens through which everything is read and interpreted to the point that either Yeshua is no longer who the Bible says he is, or he's abandoned entirely. But let, well, what you're, what you're doing the here... What, in the sense that you divorce Yeshua so much from the Jewish people that he will no longer be, he is no longer Jewish. Um, I, I do the, I've done the opposite the for decades. There are... There are Jews who separate him from uh, from his Jewishness in the, in the Messianic community, um, which is quite quite upsetting to me in the sense that they um, don't see that there is a larger context. So when I was going in uh, seminary, I was given a book called Biblical Hermeneutics, and it said you have to read everything um, in in its proper context. And part of that was a logical historical interpretation of Scripture, which means that you have to read it. Um, as the readers would have read it and have understood it. And at that time, these debates were going on. And so the, the, the question is, is regarding these, these topics are coming up. He's speaking in a context, and you have to understand the context to understand what he's talking about. Um, the other thing is, is that we have two options that we can choose. We can either choose um, the church traditions, which interpret Scripture in, an, uh, in sometimes an anti-Semitic way, and we, or we can follow the Jewish traditions in understanding it. Um, there's no sola scriptura. Sola scriptura um, is condemned harshly by the New Testament, and also um, there is no basis, there is no actual uh, sola scriptura. If we say we are sola scriptura, we are denying uh, basic facts in the, how we interpret Scripture. Right. So w once again, as the author of the book, The Real Kosher Jesus, as someone who's devoted decades to studying Jewish background to the New Testament and works with top scholars, Messianic Jews and Christians who are constantly looking at Yeshua in the first century Jewish context. Uh, and with many, many Messianic Jewish friends who are Torah observant in light of the spirit more than in light of rabbinic tradition, I remind you of the principle of what Yeshua said. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? That's why it doesn't defile. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles the person. The whole point he's making, the whole point is, is that the hand-washing thing, whatever the reason, was misplaced. It was misplaced, and that's why the disciples didn't do it, period. It misunderstood what was actually happening. All right, we come back. I want you to give me your number one best scriptural argument for believing Jews follow rabbinic tradition. Hey friends, this is Dr. Michael Brown. You know, we've been on the air 13 years daily, five days a week. We've never... There's a very interesting verse in the book of Revelation in the third chapter. As Jesus is speaking to one of the churches in Asia Minor, Revelation chapter 3, he gives this promise. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So that leads to the question, is it possible to have your name blotted out of the book of life? Is it possible to be a believer and have your name blotted out? I say yes. As I understand scripture, we can choose to walk away from God. We can choose to forfeit eternal life. We can choose to forfeit our status as sons and daughters of God. We can choose to leave his household and his family and reject him as Lord. Now, I want to be perfectly clear. He has promised to keep us safe to the end. 
No one can pluck us out of his hand. Nothing can separate us from his love. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He does not write our name in the Lamb's Book of Life in pencil. And when we do good, he writes it a little stronger. When we do bad, he erases half of it. And I'm saved one day and lost the next. And saved one minute and lost the next. That's unscriptural. That's no way to live. That's contrary to what Scripture says. We need to rest in his promises, rest in his goodness, Rest in the assurance that he will keep us strong to the end, that he will finish what he started. I believe that. I believe that he has the power to keep everything I've entrusted to him until that day. At the same time, the many warnings through the New Testament I take with utmost seriousness from Paul, from Peter, from John, from others. I take with the utmost seriousness that we can turn away from the Lord, in which case he would blot our name out of the book of life. May it never happen to you. May it never happen to me. For truth, here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Words of Isaiah 12, you'll draw water from the wells of salvation. Michael Brown on Thirdly Jewish Thursday. It's, well, won't give out the number because we, we won't be getting to calls. If you've been on hold, my apologies, but you can post your question in about a half hour, a little less, uh, on our YouTube chat. That's at Ask Dr. Brown, A-S-K-D-R Brown. Uh, I won't get into a debate about Sola Scriptura. I feel confident I can uh, make that debate just based on Scripture. But David, we've only got one segment left. Give me yep. your your single best verse that that you are convinced obligates Jewish followers of Jesus to submit to all ongoing rabbinic authoritative rabbinic tradition to this day. Um, so the best one is Matthew twenty three, uh, verse two, which says. Um, the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses, do as they do, don't do as they say. Um, do as they say, don't do as they do. All right, hang on. Did you quote that accurately? I mix, I mix it up. Um, do as they, um, Matthew 23, 2. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with it. You wrote yep. about it in your book. Um, and so I'll, 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 I'll read it. Yeah, I'll, I'll read it for you. You left out the scribes. So the scribes yep. and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and right. observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. All right, so go ahead. You can explicate that for a couple of minutes. Sure. So um, if we were to, I mean, in, uh, in, um, in Matthew, he, he gives the, um, so Peter, he says, whatever you loose in uh, Matthew eighteen eighteen, it says, whatever you loose in heaven uh, will be loose. Will whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And so, traditionally, that's a Jewish way of uh, in of binding and loosing. This idea of something is mutter is permitted. If something is aser, it's, pro- it's uh, prohibited. Um, and so he's going through and he's doing that. Um, and so he's telling us to listen to what the Pharisees say. And so. What the Pharisees say is recorded in Talmud, um, and later on, sort of extrapolated uh, that tradition is passed down until they get to the rabbis. Um, and so we should do what they say. And in fact, in Matthew 23, um, in the the middle of the woes, as you call them, uh, Matthew 23, um, uh, where is it? Uh, 23. I got the wrong address for that. Uh, Matthew 23, 23, it says, Well, you Torah scholars and Pharisees, hypocrites, you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, you have neglected the weightier matters of the Torah, justice and mercy and faithfulness. It is, necess- it is necessary to do these things without neglecting the others. And so for me, Yeshua was really about making sure that you have um, the character development that matches the keeping of the Torah, that they are both equally uh, important. And um, we know that Matthew 23, 23, when it talks about tithing, mint, dill, and cumin, uh, in Nineveh 49 and 50, is listed as a chumrah. Um, and he says, do not uh, neglect the weight, these uh, small matters of the law um, for the for the heavier matters of Musar, um, of character development. And so for me, uh, we should be looking at the Torah and doing it 
uh, with the with the in, uh, incredible stringencies list, listed in Matthew 20:23, 20, uh, tithing, mint, dill, and cumin, but also having our character uh, transformed by Yeshua um, to um, bring us clo- uh, into a closer and right relationship with God. All right. So, in other words, the the key leaders of his generation, who are then the forerunners of those who developed Mishnah, Talmud, law codes, that they were passing on right traditions that should be followed, but they themselves were damnable hypocrites, hence the the seven woes, and their example should not be followed, correct? Right. So the issue is um, with hypocrisy, and that occurs in every religion. It occurs in Christianity, it occurs in Judaism, it occurs in uh, Islam, it it occurs in pretty much any time where you have a religion, you will have some form of of hypocrisy. It's almost a given that that will happen. All right, but it's the opposite of what Paul said. Opposite of what Paul said, follow me the way I follow the Messiah, in in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, or Philippians 4, 9, whatever you've seen, learned in me, do, or Hebrews 13, 7, follow the example of your leaders. So whereas Mishnah Talmud are constantly telling you, follow the example of the rabbinic leaders, follow the example of the Pharisee forebearers, Jesus is saying the opposite of that. Don't follow their example because they're a bunch of hypocrites. He's saying to do what they do, or do what they say, not do what they do. All right, so, so um, you, you have fundamentally undermined the entire history of Jewish tradition, which is based on the character of those passing on the traditions. And if the, the tradents rejected the person's moral character, that was considered a fundamental violation of Torah. Didn't matter how much they learned, how much they knew, the, and, and how accurately they were passing things down. They have now undermined their status in the Jewish community by being moral hypocrites. So what you're what you're saying, I don't know if it's it's a revelation to you, but what you're saying is completely undermining your entire argument that the ones responsible for passing these things on are not exemplars themselves. In, in, in fact, I, I mean, there's well-known account in, in, in Psachim, in, in, in the Talmud, of you, you even watch the way the rabbi defecates, because it's Torah too, that everything, the way he has sex with his wife, the guy hides under the bed. It's like, well, this is Torah too. I got to find out the right way to do all this, that they're supposed to be living examples. Paul speaks of the believers being living, living examples, and yet, yet you're saying that, no, 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 they're hypocrites and don't follow their example, but do follow their word. I mean, I find that contrary to the entire biblical ethic. But, well, but, I mean, but, but we, everybody, all Christians, fundamentally follow that as well. I mean, the, if we trust the rabbis who created the canon of the, uh, of the Tanakh, um, then, we, then we trust them for other teachings as well. If we reject the uh, the canon of the Tanakh, which was established by the rabbis. Um, I mean, we then we're really heretics. Um, if we accept it, then we are embracing, at least in some sense, um, an honoring of Jewish tradition. Yeah, but the first thing is, uh, I'm not Catholic, right? And, and I, I fully recognize that God works through history to establish canon— beyond the synagogue, beyond the church. Look, the Qumran sectarians, as far as we know and understand, uh, recognize the same books of the Bible as the Pharisees, and, and they, they reject it. You know, you've got it in, in, in the, the, the earliest halakhic document, the 4QMMT document from Qumran, the debate between the, the halakha of Qumran versus Pharisaic halakha and their differences. And the Qumran sectarians reject it Pharisaic claims of, of tradition. Uh, so in, in any case, you can accept that God works through history. But when you're talking about the validity of oral Torah, all I'm saying is the oral Torah itself refutes you, that, that the oral Torah itself is against your viewpoint and says that these people should be rejected if they are not examples of what we preach. And, and then even more importantly, what, what we come to is in Matthew 21, and, and this is really the, the crux of the matter, that he says to the, the chief priests and the Pharisees, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people 
producing its fruits. And hence the new leaders in the community are the Messianic Jewish leaders who may have kept some of the traditions and they had different backgrounds. But as Paul writes in Romans 7, it is not by the old way of the written code, but the new way of life in the spirit. And that, that was the, the spiritual halakha that Yeshua laid out that so separated things. David, I... So you believe, but you, you, I was not aware that you believe in replacement theology. No, I categorically reject it. But you the just new, said it was taken away from the Jews. No, I said it was taken away from the Pharisees Yeshua. and given to the Messianic Jewish leaders. It was taken we away from the Pharisees. the church. It's not replacement of, of the people. The promises to Israel may remain the same. It is replacement of the leadership over Israel. That's what he's talking about there. That's the parable there in Matthew 21. That, the spiritual the leaders church. of Israel were replaced by the apostles. So it's no longer in that, the... In Matthew 18, 18, he says that this is talking about that you whatever you uh, prohibit uh, on earth will be prohibited in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. This is the, the passing on of that idea. If you say that, it has to be subject to the law of Moses and the system that Moses established with Yisroh in, in Exodus chapter 18. Right. But the the, the point took that and then, be, and then created it. So I, I'm, I'm not even dealing with the church there. For. Those are Messianic Jews he's talking to there, David. Those are Messianic right. Jews he's talking to, not the Pharisees. He's now giving the authority to them, and that's why they operate outside of the authority of the rabbinic community. And that's why we know as the Messianic Jews continued that they were put out by the rabbinic community and often rejected by the church as well. I'm all for Messianic Jews living as Jews. I'm all for Messianic Jews honoring Torah in the life of the spirit. I'm all for Messianic Jews saying, hey, these traditions are beautiful to me and I enjoy doing them. I'm categorically against Messianic Jews saying they're obligated to follow rabbinic tradition. David, as someone who has on your end already embraced apostate beliefs, I pray that God would give you a spirit of repentance before it's too late. Please, my friend, hear me. You asked to come on the air. I'm more grieved than when I invited you on. May the Lord bring you to real tshuva, you, your wife, your community, and to the fullness of Yeshua. May it be so. You can't